There's something vaguely familiar about this. Hey there friends, welcome back to the channel. My name's Alex Lokes and today I'm going to be reviewing one of the oldest cameras I have in my collection and one of my all-time favorites. And that is the Roloflex 2.8F, a twin lens reflex camera. And as you know, ever since the discovery and publishing of the works of Vivian Mayer, TLRs have become incredibly popular among, the, among film photographers. Thankfully, I got mine before their popularity really shot up, so I didn't have to pay too much money for it. And it quickly became one of my favorite cameras. TLRs and I have a long history. My first two medium format cameras were TLRs, the Lubitel 2 and the Shika 12, and now the Roloflex 2.8F. It's a camera with a lot of heritage, a lot of history, and has been a constant companion for many, many years despite a few restrictions that it has. But before I get actually out into the field and shooting here in downtown Guelph, let's take it back to the studio. We can talk a little bit about the history of the camera and I can give you a brief tour of the camera and its functions. The history of the Roloflex 2.8F is a long and complex one. Rather than bore you with the entirety of it, let's break it down to some of the key advanced points within the Roloflex line that helped get to the 2.8F. The earliest known TLRs came from the 1880s, but it wasn't until the 20th century that they started to gain popularity. In 1920, two men joined forces, Reinhold Heidecki and Paul Frank. The idea was that they were going to put some ideas into play that Heidecki had while working for Voigtlander. While the Roloflex TLR wasn't the first product produced by the new firm, it certainly proved the most popular. In 1927, the release of the original Roloflex took the world by storm. Despite the fact that the camera itself wasn't further advanced than most other cameras of the age, its construction is what set it apart. There was no bellows, no cloth shutters. The camera could be used in almost any environment without risk damaging it, thanks to the injection molded aluminum body, leatherette coating, and a unique rack and pinion focusing system, and a mechanical compour leaf shutter. Also the optics, a Carl Zeiss Tessar 75mm f3.8 lens. The Roloflex proved an instant success and an initial order of 800 copies were made within the first month, aimed primarily at photojournalism. But these early model Roloflexes used the standard red window frame advance, and that proved difficult in the fast-paced world of photojournalism. In 1938, the introduction of the Roloflex Automat changed all that. It allowed for automatic film advance and loading without need to watch that red window. The crank would advance the film, the frame counter would show the frame number you're on, and most importantly, cranking would also automatically recock the shutter for the next shot. Of course, 1939, World War II opened in Europe, and the Allied bombing campaign against Nazi Germany destroyed 65% of Frank and Heidecke's production. But they found themselves in the Allied zone of occupation and quickly found that they would be returned to service in order to facilitate the industrial and economic recovery of Western Germany. The problem was, Carl Zeiss found itself on the other side of the Iron Curtain under Soviet control. And while they quickly were reassembled and rebuilt a new factory at Jena, schneider Kreuznach lenses found themselves on Roloflex cameras. By 1949, the release of the Roloflex 2.8A introduced the first model with the Carl Zeiss Tessar 80mm f2.8 lens. Unfortunately, that same year saw the death of Paul Frank. It was a low point for the company, but his son Horst quickly took over his father's position and introduced a golden age for the company. Rapid development followed. By 1952, the Roloflex 2.8B 
which used a Carl Zeiss Biometar 80mm f2.8 was released and quickly replaced with the iconic Zeiss Planar or Schneider Zenartar. These were known as the Roloflex 2.8C. In 1964, the Roloflex 3.5E introduced the idea of a selenium meter. This would carry on to the 2.8E. These meters were not coupled and instead displayed an EV setting which the photographer could then dial in using the shutter and aperture control knobs. It was in 1969 with the release of the 2.8F that you actually saw coupled metering. Production of the 2.8F 2 2 proved most popular and continued all the way into 1981 and even resulted in several special anniversary versions and other variants. Production of the newer models lasted from 1987 to 2009 and these were known as the 2.8 GX and the 2.8 FX. And here is the beauty. At the front you have what actually gives the camera its name, the twin lenses. The bottom lens, a Carl Zeiss Planar 80mm f2.8, is the taking lens. This actually contains the shutter and the aperture. The top lens is the viewing lens, so it's not as advanced as the planar, but it does just a fine job. You have also at your front your control knobs, aperture and shutter, and then up at the top you actually have them displayed here with nice easy view. Also on the front you have a standard PC sync port and your shutter release, and it actually has a locking lever, so you can actually lock it down or release it and allow it to take. You also have here your flash control and the nice thing is is that you have an option of using either flash bulbs or electronic shutter. Because it is a leaf shutter you have unlimited shutter speeds at which you can sync your shutter so it will work at any speed. Also at the front you have your selenium metering cell. Now this is actually a weak point in the camera because this I know will eventually die but as a mechanical camera I can just keep metering with it. On the side you have your ASA settings for the meter and it's fairly limited but you can go up to 1600 and all the way down to 12 so pretty average for cameras of the uh, age. And then this also acts as an EV setting and you can go to uh, minus three, but I generally leave that at zero. You have here at the side your focusing knob and the actual match meter, needle meter readout. Up at the top, you have your waist level finder and your focusing loop. On this side, you have your crank and your frame counter and then at the bottom is your accessory screw mount and you can actually get a special mount that will allow you to put a standard tripod socket in here. I have one of those thankfully so that's super handy. If you don't you can just get a step down ring here. Flip that aside and that unlocks the back. And then you have inside that's where you put your take up spool and that's where your film is. And it's very important that when loading, you actually put your um, film through this as that's what will catch and engage the frame counter. If you do that, it will just roll through the entire roll. Big mistake I made the first time. Big thanks out to Roger, may he rest in peace, of CamTech who actually showed me how to load this properly because the German language manuals weren't clear. All right, I think that's enough talking. You want to see this thing in action. So let's head back to Guelph. Okay, so today, as I mentioned before, I'm in downtown Guelph. I have a roll of Ilford Delta 400, which I'm shooting at 400 because it's dull and foggy here in Guelph today. And I'm going to be developing it in flick film, black, white, and green, a lovely film developer. And if you haven't checked it out, I certainly recommend doing so. You can find more about it in the description below. But without further ado, let's get shooting.
any TLR camera is going to cut a handsome figure. But the first thing you're going to notice on the Roloflex is those pair of big, bright f2.8 lenses. And having an f2.8 lens for both the viewing and taking lenses is what makes working with the Roloflex pure joy. Controls are exactly where you expect them to be, with a pair of dials located on the front of the camera between the taking and viewing lenses. One dial controls your shutter speed, while the other con the controls the aperture. The numbers are located right in front of the waist level finder on the top of the viewing lens mount. Metering is achieved through a coupled match needle selenium meter mounted on the focusing knob. The combination of the 80mm f2.8 viewing lens and a bright matte screen makes composition and focusing a breeze, and despite the age of the camera, the focusing screen remains bright, but you can easily swap that out for a Maxwell bright screen. If you're doing any close focusing, or fine focusing when working with larger apertures, there is a viewing loop to aid you. When loading to the film, make sure to tuck the backing paper through the rollers at the bottom. This will engage the auto frame counter. Then just use the crank to advance to that first frame. Don't go too fast, you have a chance to miss that frame. So one of the most interesting things are some of the other ways you can actually shoot and compose with the uh, Roloflex according to the manual. Some involved like shooting it upside down and kind of getting it like that, which personally seems a bit awkward. You also have a lovely sports finder where you can actually drop it down and then stare through it that way. And also you can replace the uh, waist level finder with an angled finder. You can put a grip on the bottom, a tripod socket on the bottom, and it just makes the camera so much useful. But frankly, I prefer it in just the stock configuration the way it is. That's how I learned and that's how I continue to shoot it today. But what makes a Roloflex a Roloflex is truly the optics. So let's talk about those for a bit. What helps produce the legendary images out of the Roloflex are the Carl Zeiss optics. The planar design is a double gauss lens with six elements. As an anastigmat lens, the name planar comes from the flat image plane. The lens design allows for low chromatic aberration, but does tend to have coma, especially when dealing with off-axis light. But this can be overcome using a lens hood. If you've ever worked with a Zeiss planar 80mm f2.8 lens, you'll know the performance is top-notch. With no corner fall off or vignetting, and images are sharp at any aperture. And if you get the focus right, you'll get a nice swirly out of focus rendering. The downside is you're stuck with that 80mm focal length, which is which on your 6x6 negative size is about the normal field of view for the human eyes. Zooming must be done with your feet. Mounting accessories is done through a bayonet system with an inner and outer mount. The outer mount is for the lens hood, which is a must in hard light. The inner mount is for filters, and the size is known as a bay 3. Well, that covers it. I love this camera. I still love this camera. I try to shoot it as much as I can, but I understand that these are not for the faint of heart. They're not cheap by any stretch of the imagination. Most on the used market today will go 
above $2,000, most going for three to $4,000 each. But don't worry, you don't have to go with the 2.8 F model. The 3.5 planar F model is just a good camera with excellent optics as well. Plus, most go for between $900 to $1,100. So again, not cheap, but I feel it's worth it because these are just amazing cameras. And like anything, you really have to watch out. The first thing that will go on these is the Selenium meter. But as it's a fully mechanical camera, you can just use an external meter. One thing you could do is mount a shoe on the side and use a little Reveni Labs hot shoe meter or their external spot meter, or even your phone or just go Sunny 16 with it. The meter is not necessary. And definitely any camera that you buy on the used market, you do want to send it away for a CLA. Make sure all those shutter speeds are good and nothing sticking on the shutter. That's it for this video. Let me know in the comments, what is your experience with TLRs? Do you like them? Do you dislike them? Or are you just indifferent towards them? And what's your favorite brand? Do you like interchangeable lenses with the Mamiya? Or do you prefer the uh, bargain basement Yashikas, which are fabulous TLRs as well? Let me know in the comments. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing, hitting that bell notification icon, give me a thumbs up. And until next time, get out there, stay safe. Two heads aren't always better than ones, but two lenses definitely are.